Welcome, Tracy. It's good to have you back this time in a virtual form. We're delighted you accepted Rinda's invitation. I know you've been up since literally the crack of dawn. Sorry, you're based at the other end of the world from us on the west coast of the US. The long commute to your office and I hope you freshened up and welcome and we're looking forward to hear you speak. Just a few words I would like to add about the archives. Being conscious innovators from the very beginning, Godrich started mulling over the idea of setting up an archive way back in 1997, when we were celebrating our centenary year. With the motto of restore, reflect, and reimagine, Godrej Archives helps the organization with collecting storage and conservation of its historically important records using state-of-the-art standards and practices. It regularly holds exhibitions, lectures, and workshops to generate awareness about the organization's history and the preservation of India's corporate heritage. One of the new ideas that we have introduced to the archives are research fellowships. This is to encourage research in the field of business history and the archives in collaboration with the Center for Studies in Social Sciences based in Kolkata started its research fellowship in business history from the year 2018. These fellowships enable those interested in research in business and industrial history to conduct research and present their work at either seminars or conferences organized by the Godrej Archives and the CSSSC publish the research papers under the Godrej Fellowship Program. A few words about the Museum Society of Mumbai. We are turning 60 in the year 2022-23. The society is an NGO. We're all volunteers at this society and we give off our time to the CSMVS, which is the leading institute for museology in our city of Mumbai, free. We adore our museum and we hope we're living up to the expectations of those who run it. So on behalf of the chairperson and the trustees of the Museum Society of Mumbai, and on my own behalf from the Museum Society of the members of the Museum Society, Tracy, a very, very warm welcome to you. We are really, really delighted and we are so happy that you have permitted us to place this lecture on YouTube so that those of us who have not been able to join this evening can take advantage at their leisure to join from the comfort of their home whenever they like. We also have a lot of NGOs that we work with. The little ones, of course, it's too broad a subject and too in-depth a subject. But those that run these NGOs and our members who work for these NGOs, they will be really happy to introduce the subject of archiving to the little ones, either through a history program or a sociology program. So we're so happy that we can put this talk on the YouTube. So thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got her on the screen, but I'd like to say a few words about Tracy Panek. She actually came to Bombay as a speaker at the International Council of Archives conference that we had held here in 2017. It was a very, very memorable event. And we had very active participation, not only from Tracy, but from some of her many, many colleagues. And I remember Levi was a big draw at this conference and you had lots of Q&A at the end of your talk. Tracy has been working at Levi Strauss and Company and manages the day-to-day -day workings of this company in her archival role as a key corporate asset, answering historical questions, assisting designers, brand managers, executives, and other employees whose work requires historical materials in the archives. I don't have to tell you 
We can only build our future if we know our past. She is a regular contributor to their house magazine, which is very nicely titled Unzipped. And she does the company's blog, writing about company history, vintage Levi garments, many of them you'll see this evening on the screen, and behind the scenes and archive highlights. Tracy is the media spokesperson for Levi Strauss and a custodian of its heritage. So thank you very, very much, Tracy. I have only one more announcement to make, and that is to all of you members and our guests, really grateful to you for coming this evening. It's dinner time in India, it's breakfast time on the West Coast. So I appreciate your sparing this hour and joining us because it means a lot to have this partnership and it means a lot to have this support. And last but not the least, this whole year, ladies and gentlemen, has gone in the pandemic. But we have learned fast and we have learned quick. But I really need to thank our technical team who has supported us evening after evening, Thursday after Thursday. And this week they've supported us on Monday, this evening and on Saturday. So a big round of applause to Aishwarya, Mrinalini and Sanjana and Yashraj who are with us today, so ably led by who else? but Professor Jason Johns, Honorary Secretary of the Museum Society of Mumbai. So now I hand you over to the technical team, Tracy. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the evening. Brinda and team at Archives, thank you so much for your support. We're looking forward to hearing Tracy speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Godridge. It's lovely to see you again. I appreciate your introduction. And uh, I, like you, am very grateful to the technical team uh, in India. And of course, uh, the technical team that we have at Levi Strauss and company that has allowed us to continue to operate. Um, I bring you greetings from San Francisco. Good evening uh, to most of you. I'm just starting my day out. In fact, it's so early that I beat everybody into the office. Uh, you will see I'm, I'm indoors. I haven't been in here all of the time. Uh, we closed down uh, to the public last March and a uh, few of us come in on an as needed basis. Uh, the plan is that we will return to a hybrid schedule next month in September. Meanwhile, if I was to go out to the rest of our offices, I'd of course be putting my mask on and getting things uh, prepared, but I'm delighted to be with you and spend some time with you talking about, of course, one of my favorite subjects. I'm gonna bring up my screen here. And before I, join uh, before I talk about, uh, there we go, before I talk about my main subject today, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, to kind of set the, the tone for what the talk is about today. A little history of Levi Strauss and Company, uh, where I'm the historian. Uh, the company is one of the oldest American apparel brands that's still in existence today. Almost 170 years of history. It began in the height of the California gold rush in 1853. It was founded by our namesake, uh, Levi Strauss. He was an immigrant to uh, America from Germany. And he arrived in San Francisco on a very rainy March uh, back in 1853 and set up a dry goods wholesale business near the waterfront in San Francisco. He was importing and exporting products, uh, selling uh, everything from umbrellas and underwear to fabric. And our headquarters today in San Francisco is not far from that original location. We're just down the street a little bit. Uh, this is where we are located at the base of Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. So if you come to visit, you'll just know that this is our location. You can fly into San Francisco, of course, but if you wanna do something very fun, you can actually take a cruise ship and the cruise ship terminal is just adjacent to our offices. So you can get off the ship and walk over, which is what a lot of uh, visitors uh, pre-COVID did. And I uh, hope uh, we'll be able to welcome them back um, once things in the pandemic get under control. 
along with being the historian at Levi Strauss and Company, I manage the company archives, which is a treasure trove. And that's where I'm sitting today. The most important items in our collection are in this blue fireproof safe behind me. And that includes the very oldest pair of blue jeans in the world uh, that you see pictured on the screen on the left. They don't look much different from the blue jeans that we wear today. Uh, they date it. Those ones date to 1879. Uh, and other items that we have in our archives include the Levi Strauss jacket, a leather jacket that was purchased by Albert Einstein during the 1930s when he immigrated to the United States and was becoming a naturalized American citizen. At Levi's, we think it's pretty special that as he was becoming an official American, he brought he bought a jacket from an iconic American brand. And he wore it so frequently that he was actually featured wearing it on the cover of Time Magazine in 1938. You can see it there in that picture. Other items that we have in the archives include newer pieces uh, like this collection that uh, we created in India, our Kadi collection in 2016. And it was made uh, by hand handwoven fabrics that were made by weavers in India. And on each of the pieces, uh, the name of the weaver is included. Uh, earlier this year, we launched a new series on YouTube called uh, Levi's from the Archives. You can subscribe to it if you're interested. We've done uh, several episodes, but the first episode that we did uh, was really a virtual tour of this space and what we do here in the archives. So I'm going to turn off my screen and let the technical team share that video so you can get a look virtually behind the scenes at our archives. I know where we're going to where your family began, with the same Levi's blue jeans worn by this man. Levi's. I'm Tracy Panic, historian at Levi's Strauss and Company and director of the Levi's Archives. The story of Levi's is a story that spans almost 170 years. It's about an immigrant who established an iconic American company. And then in the late 1800s, the innovation that started with just a tiny idea, a little rivet added to pockets in, in denim pants. And as we follow through that history, it's the story of the people who wore those first riveted clothes, beginning with blue collar laborers from cowboys, people in westerns in the Hollywood, rebels, rockers. Uh, and today, uh, those who even wear Levi's on catwalks. We've got the place to ourselves, so come on in. This is the archives, and that's my desk over the corner. And if you were a designer, I would bring you over to this table. You probably would be wearing your own measuring tape. If not, we have extra, because you're going to be measuring all the details to make the greatest new Levi's looks. Welcome to the research area. I'm glad you're here, because we have amazing things. Everything from catalogs and letters, photographs to advertisement are all in this section. I love this picture of Levi's house in Butenheim, Germany. Levi's vintage sneakers from the late 70s. Really big knives to cut through the denim that was used to make Levi's. This one is filled with our Western ads that date back to the 1950s. This would sit on a counter. You can see our red tab and the two horse. This 1980s trucker jacket was owned by a man who wanted to end the Cold War. Our 1880s headquarters. Look at those guys, all of our salesmen dressed for success, copper rivets, so we've got plenty of those in the archives. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's a check blotter. Look at this beautiful letter written in the 1940s. We have in our conservation lab 
items like this pH testing strip. So we know when we test the water where our jeans have come from. If we have a pair of Levi's that come in dirty like this, we'll take them, we'll put them inside a, a great big bin like this, fill it with plain old San Francisco tap water. And then if we need to do any kind of cleaning, we only use the softest kinds of brushes. You like this? And we can just brush it like that. All the really great stuff is in the back. Hold on there, cowboy. Don't give away all our secrets, all of the outfits for the InSync members. And if you're a fan of Project Runway, you'll especially love this. If you've ever heard the term Canadian tuxedo jacket, it comes from this lovely piece. This piece by Jacques Foth. He's taken a Levi's trucker jacket. You can still see our red tab there, and he's transformed it. Just a few of the things in our closet. The archives really spans not only the history of our company, but just this diverse wealth of materials from garments and photographs to advertising and marketing pieces, along with the stories of people, real people, how they've lived in Levi's, and from all of those stories, be able to put together a really fabulous understanding of the company's history. Thank you for that. Let me share my screen and we will continue. That'll give you a look at the kinds of uh, materials that I work with and what I do every day. Uh, but I want to get into the heart of our topic, the global blue jeans transformation. And to begin, let me share uh, an advertisement. This is a picture from one of our advertisements from 2017. It begins uh, in evening. It's a party outdoors. There's lots of young people that are milling about. And two of them, uh, a man and a woman, see each other. They're both wearing denim and blue jeans. They see each other from across the space. Uh, there is a beautiful swimming pool in the middle of the area and they start to come closer and closer to each other until they get just over the swimming pool and they embrace and then plunge into the swimming pool. We call that advertisement Sea of Blue. And of course, it's a reference to the water in the pool, uh, blue, the color of water or the color of our oceans. Uh, in fact, we call our planet often the blue planet, and it's a reference to the fact that 70% of the globe is covered with water. But today, I want to propose a second definition for the blue planet. So let me propose another definition for blue planet. Instead of 70% of the world's oceans covered, uh, what if we consider that so many people around the, around the world, around the globe, are wearing denim, that it really has become the world's global garment? Uh, in several years ago, two sociologists from the UK uh, wrote a book called Global Denim. And in it, they theorized that if you were to go anywhere on the planet, virtually anywhere on the planet, and observe what people were wearing, you would find that at least half of them were wearing blue jeans. That idea that blue jeans have become the default global garment is what I want to talk about tonight. And I want to give you a few examples of blue jeans from around the world. Uh, here's the photograph that was taken from Penco, Chile, the west coast of South America. You can see a pair of blue jeans hanging up on the line, um, waiting to dry. And then on the other side of the world, this is Mudu Sangyang. He is a Levi's fan. He's wearing a pair of Levi's 526 jeans, and he's holding a pair of his vintage Levi's jeans. He's from the Gambia in West Africa. And of course, uh, you might recognize uh, this photo that I snapped uh, when I visited Mumbai in, 20, uh, in 2015. This is the Dobie Ghat, the, uh, the famous outdoor laundry area. And what I was so taken with when I visited is that I looked at all of the garments that were hanging up. And you can see in the distance that almost half of them that are hanging up there to dry are blue jeans. So what led to this global blue jeans transformation? Well, it got to start at the beginning. It's the story of collaboration and a tiny but innovative idea. 
In the 1870s, uh, Levi Strauss there, an older established businessman who'd been in San Francisco almost 20 years and had a number of retailing, uh, retail customers, including the man on the right. His name is Jacob Davis. He was a tailor in Reno, Nevada, and he wrote a letter in 1872 to Levi and the company, told them, uh, asked them for some supplies. He needed to order some more fabric and other things for his shop, but he also told them of an unusual idea that he'd had to make work pants. He had taken denim, added a little bit of metal to the pockets, and in doing that, he created a super strong pair of work pants. He began selling them, and they were so popular he couldn't keep up with the demand. And he proposed that Levi and his company take out a patent for this process. Up to this point, Levi hadn't done any manufacturing, but he agreed. And on May 20th, 1873, Levi Strauss and Company and Jacob Davis received a patent for an improvement in fastening pocket openings. We refer to this day as the birthday of blue jeans. And in two years, 2023, blue jeans will turn 150 years old. Those first riveted denim pants were worn by laboring men, miners, railroad engineers, cowboys, anyone who needed tough work pants. And they are, were so strong that they endured uh, for almost uh, today, almost 150 years later. In fact, we still find pieces of riveted denim in places like Colorado. Uh, this was a photo that I took last October when I traveled to Colorado to acquire a new pair of, uh, well, a new old pair of Levi's from a mining shed that I'm standing in front of, still in great condition. So how did this Western blue jean, this American pant, end up all over the world? Well, I want to take a Levi's look at some of the factors that contributed to that and the first thing that I think is important to talk about is denim and indigo. Uh, first, it's important to note that denim was not invented by Levi Strauss and company. It had been a long time workwear fabric. In fact, indigo, uh, which is the dye that's used to make denim, uh, is found and grows all over the world. It's almost ubiquitous. It's found in so many different places. But it was believed uh, some years ago that the earliest pieces of, of indigo dyed fabric came from Egypt uh, some 4,000 years ago. But I traveled in 2016 to Peru. I had the opportunity to trek to Machu Picchu. It was amazing. But I also had the chance while I was there to meet some of the people uh, who make textile textiles there. And they shared with me uh, some of the textile dyeing techniques that they used for their woolen clothes. Uh, a month after I returned from my trip to Peru, I was delighted to see news coverage come out that said this from places like the Washington Post and the National Geographic. The blue for blue jeans was first made 6,200 years ago in Peru. What was originally thought as being something that came from Egypt 4,000 years ago was determined to actually be an American product uh, coming from South America over 6,000 years ago. Pretty amazing news. Uh, and not a surprise to, uh, to, to us at Levi Strauss and Company. For the denim that was used for the first blue jeans, it was indigo dyed, plant indigo dyed, uh, but it came from America, from the east coast of America, actually. Uh, we sourced it in those first years from the Amiskag Mills in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, it was named Manchester uh, for Manchester, England, where historically so many of the textile uh, mills and industry had taken place. For those first uh, years, those first decades that we made blue jeans, this is where we sourced our, uh, our denim from. It was made from 100% cotton grown in the Southern United States. And by 1915, we started uh, moving and sourcing from other mills in North Carolina, uh, the cone mills where we continue to source from today. But I wanted to give you a look at what indigo dyed fibers look like because it's one of the unique features of blue jeans. Uh, they are dyed with indigo using a technique called rope dyeing. And you can see from the photo that 
the um, threads are dipped in the indigo and the outside threads of the indigo, uh, they absorb that blue color, but the center white of that cotton does not get completely blue. And it's the reason that when you see blue jeans, like the picture on the right, that over time you can see uh, outlines appearing from the wear marks. You can clearly see the uh, phone that that man is carrying in his blue jeans because the white has come, uh, has, has worn through. It's that feature of blue jeans that makes it one of the more remarkable uh, factors in making them so individual because blue jeans can really tell a story about the person who is wearing them. And I'll give you a few examples. This is a blue jean that dates to uh, 1890. It was worn by a cowboy. We know that the cowboy wore his pants a little long because the bottom of the pants have some wear marks. You see that kind of pooling. We know that they would have kind of been folding uh, at the bottom of the leg. We also know that the cowboy who wore this uh, pair was right-handed because there's patching on the front right thigh where he probably was holding the reins and they were torn by spurs. You can see those tear marks at the bottom. Here's another pair of blue jeans that date to World War II. And you can see, I can tell that the person, the man probably that was wearing these was wearing a belt. See how much darker the blue is at the top waistband? I also know that he was wearing this, these uh, pair of blue jeans cuffed. You can see the blue cuff mark on the bottom hem. And uniquely, he was also wearing a pair of chaps. You see that brown kind of uh, V mark up there by, um, by the, the crotch? That's because they were covering his blue jeans. And then finally, here's a pair of blue jeans from the 1970s. Uh, they were worn by a surfer. They've completely faded from being out in the sun and the indigo has almost leached out, but you get a different story from each pair of blue jeans. Uh, finally, a look at the back pocket of Steve Jobs uh, 501. Th these date to the 1980s before he was, uh, before iPods had even been introduced. And in this image, you can see the outline uh, square in the back, probably his wallet. It's important also to look at the role of history uh, when we talk about the globalization of uh, blue jeans. And uh, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of the evolution of Levi's blue jeans. We, they were born in the American West, just like Levi Strauss and company was. And for the first 80 years or so, most blue jeans were sold in Western American states, as you can see on the map here and on that advertisement. They were sold uh, to people who were uh, laboring men and many uh, ranchers like these cowboys who were working with cattle, branding them, as you can see in this image. Uh, and uh, for those first many years, they were mainly being worn by men. But in the West, especially on ranches, they were also, uh, they also started to be worn by women. Women like the, uh, the person in this photograph whose name was Pearl Bailey. She grew up on a ranch in Utah. She rode horses, she worked with cattle, she needed tough pants, and there weren't any available specifically for women. So she started borrowing her dad's and her brother's until Levi Strauss and company introduced the first blue jeans for women. And in fact, the oldest pair of women's blue jeans uh, that uh, in the world were worn by uh, a woman named Viola. That's a picture of Viola here. Uh, she wore them in the 1930s as a college student at Fresno State University in Central California. And she even wrote her name on the inside pocket bag of her blue jeans, Viola Long Acre. What's interesting about uh, the first blue jeans for women is it marked a change in the use of blue jeans, not just as workwear. In 1935, a year after Lady Levi's, that's what we call blue jeans for women, a year after Lady Levi's were introduced, they were featured in Vogue magazine, an article about summer travel to dude ranches. Dude ranches were popular destinations where you could uh, stay on a working horse or cattle ranch, dress up as a cowboy and have a Western American experience. And Vogue magazine in the article said, if you were going to go to a dude ranch, you needed to get yourself a pair of cuffed Lady Levi's, a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and you would have a great time. That marked, again, one of the first changes that we saw uh, with 
Levi's and blue jeans becoming more uh, fashion. And of course, uh, because Levi Strauss and Company was located in San Francisco, California, north of Hollywood, uh, a lot of Hollywood costume houses began uh, dressing their leading actors beginning in the 1920s uh, westerns in blue jeans, like you see in this picture here. This is a picture of the character Poncho uh, from the popular 1950s western television series The Cisco Kid, and this was very common. Uh, to see leading actors, especially in Westerns, wearing blue jeans. It was uh, World War II, though, that marked the huge turning point in blue jeans going abroad. Many American soldiers, when they weren't wearing uh, their uniforms, they were often dressed in a pair of blue jeans. Uh, blue jeans, like this young man here uh, pictured in the photo. Uh, this is Bruce McKinnon. He's the one on the bottom right. He's wearing a pair of cuffed Levi's, and you might not recognize him, but his mother did. We know that because of a newspaper article where she described how she saw a picture, this picture on a store window and recognized her son, Bruce. She recognized him based on his haircut and his cuffed Levi's. She'd actually written to, uh, to her asking her to send him blue jeans. So she looked all around uh, many stores. They were very difficult to come by during war in World War II. She found three pairs, shipped them to him in Honolulu, and he slept on them because he didn't want his buddies to steal them. They were so popular. And uh, then he shipped overseas to Saipan. That's is where he's on his way to in this photograph. That's the first look many people in the Pacific theater and in Europe had of blue jeans. It was during World War II, uh, as well as our soldiers wearing them, you could also buy blue jeans on a number of military bases. Uh, Levi's were sold on bases like this one, Yokota Air Force Base out of Tokyo. And uh, several years ago, I met uh, Yosuke Aizawa, a designer when he came into the archives and he shared the story with me of his dad, who uh, was the drummer in a band uh, that played often at the Yokota Air Force Base. And one of his band member friends purchased a pair of Levi's blue jeans and a Levi's denim jacket and gave it to him. Uh, he wore them and then eventually gifted them to his son. Uh, and they are part of his treasured collection. So you can see uh, how blue jeans uh, began to get their uh, look from people far, as far away uh, as, uh, as Asia and Japan. After World War II, uh, as the European economy was rebuilding, American apparel manufacturers had a unique opportunity. They staged their first fashion show in Paris, all American fashion show. And among the designers that were featured, um, imagine all the couture dresses that were on display, uh, two identical twins. This is a picture of them, uh, Pat and Priscilla Emery, uh, were models in that fashion show, and they were wearing Lady Levi's cuffed blue jeans. And you, uh, for Parisians who were attending that fashion show, they got to see blue jeans for the first time. They began uh, from that moment on to become more and more popular on the fashion scene in Europe. For uh, soldiers who were returning uh, from World War II, uh, soldiers like uh, like Leo Hopkins pictured here on the right. Many of them came home uh, and they wanted to, they had uh, enjoyed the brotherhood that they had felt along with other soldiers during the war and they wanted to feel that kinship again. Many of them joined motorcycle clubs as Leo did. In fact, he belonged to the oldest African-American motorcycle club that was formed in the San Francisco Bay Area and their uniform was a pair of Levi's blue jeans worn cuffed. This is some footage from uh, Leo and his uh, the members of his motorcycle club called the Berkeley Tigers. They would do motorcycle stunts, they would do precision drills, and then they would also take uh, trips out uh, on the weekend uh, in their wearing their blue jeans, riding their Harley Davidsons. And this became uh, especially popular and a look for many motorcycle clubs. 
And of course, Hollywood mirroring what was happening in real life uh, featured a movie that became very popular. Uh, this is Marlon Brando in The Wild One from 1954. He's wearing a pair of cuffed Levi's blue jeans. Uh, he represented Johnny, the head of a motorcycle gang who terrorizes a community. It was actually based on an incident that happened south of San Francisco. But of course, he's looking very much like a rebel. It was the new image of blue jeans. And for young men of that era, they wanted to look just like him. They would dress in blue jeans as well and wear white t-shirts to, uh, to create that look of the rebel, uh, the young, cool guy. But it wasn't just men, it was also women. And if you were watching Marilyn Monroe's final film, The Misfits, you would have seen her wear a pair of Levi's, uh, Lady Levi's blue jeans. She's looking especially sensual. And what woman wouldn't want to look the same dressing just as she did? And you can see how Hollywood would have influenced uh, the popularity and rise of blue jeans. Culture also played a role in making blue jeans so popular around the world, and in particular during the 60s as a way to express yourself, especially as we consider the rise of youth culture during the 60s and in particular the late 60s. In 1967, during the summer of love, uh, the year of the summer, of love, thousands of young people uh, flooded into cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. They had a new style, a new interest in politics and expressing themselves through fashion, and blue jeans became a canvas for their expression. As an example of this is Doug Hansen, pictured on the right there. He bought a pair of Levi's uh, 501 blue jeans. He transformed them. Um, they were a bit, he bought them at a flea market. They had a few holes and tears in them. And he simply patched them up with colorful fabric from his then girlfriend, Susan, and transformed his blue jeans. He even split the bottom hem to uh, add a little bit of extra fabric to accommodate his favorite blue jeans. And this became very popular to do in the 60s to express your own personal style. Uh, you won't be surprised to learn that Doug, you can even see his name over there on the left in green, uh, became a graphic illustrator uh, and uh, taught it at university. This pair of Levi's blue jeans was worn by a man, a young man named Greg Cowper, who attended Woodstock, the ultimate outdoor uh, festival that marked the end of the 1960s. Uh, Greg went to Woodstock. He had this pair of blue jeans, he'd patched them, and he also painted a yellow owl on them. And you can see the little peace symbol on the bottom as well. He also painted his Oldsmobile, his Oldsmobile car with a yellow owl. And then he drove with his buddy, uh, to Woodstock. You can see a picture of him. Uh, he's the one holding the blue balloon laying down. If you look just behind, just in front of him, you can just make out the yellow paint of the owl that he painted on his pants. And in that picture, you can see the sea of blue that was denim at Woodstock. By the end of the 1960s, blue jeans had really become the uniform of young people. But it wasn't just limited to the United States. They were also popular in the in Europe. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Europe's version of Woodstock. It was held in Holland in 1970. And one of the people who attended was this young man here uh, named Flip Franson. Uh, he's, he's circled there uh, in the poster. He was wearing blue jeans and a, uh, a denim jacket as well, as you can see in his picture there on the left. A George Cowper, who attended Woodstock and customized his blue jeans, uh, did something that became very popular in the 60s and throughout the 70s, and something we still do today. I do that on my blue jean, I'm on my jacket that I'm wearing today. But Anna Marie Sendecki, who is featured in this picture, uh, she grew up in Queens, New York, and she took her blue jeans, uh, these happen to be orange tab Levi's, and she converted them to a skirt, a mini skirt, and then she embroidered on the back of them. And you can see uh, the glasses that she embroidered. She wore glasses and she wanted girls who also wore glasses to feel cool, so she put them on the back of her blue jeans. 
Decorating your denim and blue jeans became so popular that in uh, 1973, Levi's sponsored a denim art contest and received thousands of entries. Uh, you can see one of the entries on the left there that was created by uh, a man named Hopeton Morris. He took bottle caps from soda bottles and added them to his denim along with hair color samples to give movement uh, to the jacket. And it was one of the winning, uh, the winning pieces. Uh, the denim art contest was replicated all over the world, including places like Asia. You can see that advertisement there on the bottom right. Blue jeans were not only used to express style and what you loved, your preference, but also as a means of political expression. And for the Streshnaya family uh, in Odessa, Georgia, and the Soviet Union um, in the 1950s, uh, blue jeans were probably not on their minds. Uh, this is the father of the family holding a picture of uh, Brezhnev, his wife there on the left. But by the 1960s, when they had their daughter, uh, there she is in between them. Uh, she grew up, her name was Alexandra, and she knew about blue jeans, but blue jeans had actually been banned behind the Iron Curtain. But when she got her first job, like many young people behind the Iron Curtain, she wanted a pair of blue jeans. She took the money that she had made after one month, and she went uh, on the black market and bought herself a pair of blue jeans of Levi's from a sailor coming into Odessa who wore multiple pairs and then sold them on the black market. They became a commodity during uh, the black during the um, Cold War. And it shouldn't be a surprise that when the, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, hundreds of young people dressed in blue jeans uh, climbed atop of the wall. They had become a symbol of freedom and self-expression and youth. More recently, uh, blue jeans uh, still have a political connotation uh, in places like North Korea, where they're still banned. Uh, and in this book that was written by uh, a young North Korean girl, she described her journey to freedom. And uh, in part of the book, she describes how as a young girl, she just wanted to be able to go to the movies and wear blue jeans, something that she couldn't do in her home country. Blue jeans also in many ways reflect the global economy and the expansion of it. And uh, I'll share with you anecdotally uh, a look at where Levi's operates. Uh, we began in the American West selling mainly to states, as I mentioned, that were in the West. But uh, today, this is from our annual report in 2020, our products, our blue jeans and uh, denim products are sold in more than 110 countries around the world in most geographic regions. What about India? Uh, what is the denim and blue jean history in India? Well, India, as you probably know, uh, are relative latecomers to blue jeans and denim. And from my readings, uh, it uh, appears that it was pretty conceivable during the 1960s and 70s to watch a movie, a Bollywood movie, and not see anyone wearing denim. But that changed uh, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, by the late 80s and 90s. In fact, one of the uh, sources that I uh, researched talked about um, the transformation of the Indian economy in the late 80s and 90s. And that's when denim finally began to make a more frequent and prominent appearance in Indian media. Uh, yesterday, I had the chance to interview a denim lover, uh, someone who wears blue jeans all the time. Uh, his name is Alan Claudius. He's from Mumbai. Uh, he not only loves wearing blue jeans, but also his sneakers. You can see his very extensive sneaker collection behind him. But he talked to me about how he also loves uh, customizing his denim. Uh, he's got some bandana print. He was talking about that. Also shared with me how he enjoys uh, adding silk Indian uh, silk uh, cloths to his uh, blue jeans as well. Uh, he was also very proud to show me uh, the embroidery that he had done of his beloved uh, dachshund, his uh, pet dog that he added there, um, doing what young teens have been doing since the 60s all over the world. Here's a look at the Levi's store uh, in Mumbai uh, back in 2008. Uh, we featured an ad uh, with Akshay Kumar, a Bollywood star, of course, um, 
popularizing uh, Levi's uh, in this commercial about 501s, the world's first blue jean. And when I uh, traveled to Mumbai uh, in 2015, I brought the oldest pair of blue jeans in the world, uh, came to that, uh, that very store. And I was there to launch a new line of women's blue jeans. And uh, after that launch, they became incredibly popular, did super well um, there in India. And now, of course, during the pandemic, things are a bit on hold, as you can see from this article uh, talking about Bollywood and return to Bollywood. Uh, and what you'll see, and I imagine, uh, and, and you can see clearly from, from this image, is that denim will be returning to uh, to Bollywood, um, just like the other uh, pieces of garments that are featured on that picture. So uh, in conclusion, what are, are the global impacts of blue jeans and what way, uh, what relevant markers have we seen? Well, I have a few to share with you. Uh, the first is uh, from the Smithsonian. Uh, as early as 1964, when the American, uh, when the National Museum of American History opened, uh, they uh, added a pair of Levi's blue jeans to their collection in recognition of the importance that blue jeans had on American society. But further abroad from that, uh, more recently, MoMA, uh, several years ago, the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, staged one of their first fashion exhibitions. Uh, it was called Items, and they selected 100 pieces of uh, 100 pieces of fashion apparel that had made an impact on history. And of course, Levi's, the first blue jeans, were included among those. And finally. Um, Time Magazine in 1999 at the turn of the 20th century. They named the person of the century Albert Einstein, but they named uh, the fashion item of the 20th century, beating out the miniskirt and the little blue, a uh, little black dress, a uh, Levi's blue jeans. Uh, quite a history and quite a transformation in fashion come. 50 years ago worn by working people. And that's it 